He's so good. And um, actually what I'm talking on tonight, um, the title is Words Are Enough. And I think it's so cool just how God works because what you just heard tonight in testimonies was words. And what you saw is how powerful words really are. And we sometimes like to minimize words or think, ah, it's not that big a deal if I say that or do that. But how many of you know words are powerful? God's word tonight, when it was spoken through testimony, is powerful. I loved the divine surprise over there. Amazing. Yeah, I'll take that too. We're going on vacation soon. Praise God. But yeah, he just loves to, to just bless you, doesn't he? And I was just sitting there and I thought, you know, sometimes you just hear the Lord say, just, just ask me. And I just sensed that tonight before we started, just to ask him. You know, what does it say that those who hunger and thirst shall be what? Filled. We see it, we're reading all through the Gospels. You see when, when people asked for healing, what did he do? He didn't say, uh, I'll think about it. What did he do? He healed them. He, he longs to fulfill the desires of your heart when they match under his authority and his desires. But you know what we have to do? We have to use the words of our mouth to ask him. So can we take just a minute? I just sensed that as I was sitting there, that there's some people in here that, you know, just take a minute to just close your eyes and just to ask him. I just sensed him saying that tonight. Just ask me. Ask me. And, you know, for some of you, it may be healing. For some, it may be provision. For some, it may be wisdom. For some, it may be direction. It it may be you don't even know. And you know what? That's okay, too. Then you just say, thank you, Lord, for for you filling me. Thank you, Lord, for wisdom and direction. Just, Just to ask him. And, you know, he's not bothered with several things that you ask him. So if you have a few things, you can ask him for all those things. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you, you supply all of our needs. We thank you, Lord, that you are the great gift giver. We thank you, Lord, even as we heard tonight, the healer, the restorer. You bring direction, simple prayers, Father, of desires of our heart. We thank you, Lord. We ask you for those, and I thank you for every desire in here tonight, that as they ask, you're doing a work, and you're working for them. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, sometimes it's good to just pause. The enemy wants to get us over maybe into fear or worry. And if you just pause for a moment and just, what does the Bible say in First Peter? To cast the whole of your care onto him because he cares for you. And then in that moment when we cast our care onto him, we can ask and thank him for it and know that it's done. Amen. All right, so like I said, the title um, tonight is Words Are Enough. Words Are Enough. And um, we're going to look at mainly one passage of Scripture, but a a few passages of Scriptures here. And um, I'm going to just read this first line. It says, we take God's words, which are his thoughts, and we make them our thoughts and our words. How many of you know how important it is to take God's words, to make them our thoughts, And then not to just make them our thoughts, but to make them our words. So what what is that? His word in our mouths. His word in our mouths is powerful. Let's um, turn here to Mark 11. And we're going to look at um, Mark 11, 12 through 14. If we have that. And it says, on the day following, when they had come away from Bethany, he was hungry, he being Jesus. And seeing in the distance a fig tree covered with leaves, he went to see if he could find any fruit on it. For in the fig tree, the fruit appears at the same time as the leaves. But when he came up to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the fig season had not yet come. And he said to it, no one ever again shall eat fruit from you. And his disciples were listening to what he said. So what I love about this is this wasn't just Jesus here. What do we know? He had his disciples along with him. And did you know that even Jesus, uh, we see here that the fig tree, if it has leaves, it means it has figs. Well, this fig tree had leaves with no figs, right? And what we see is Jesus came up to it. He was a man. He was hungry. How many of you know when you're hungry, you want to eat, right? 
So he came up to this tree thinking that there was going to be something. And so Jesus needed something. He needed food at that moment, didn't he? He needed food, and he came up to what? To nothing. How many of you know sometimes in our lives we need something, and we face a situation, we face something, and what we see is nothing? There was nothing there, nothing for Jesus to partake of. And what did he do? He spoke. He spoke. And then this is further down in my notes, but I want to just go ahead and go to this um, right there. But in, um, let's see, Mark, yeah, Mark 11, we'll just read this, Mark eleven twenty three, just a few verses down. And this is a familiar um, Uh, passage. Sorry, I don't have the verses in my notes here, but it says, truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. So how many of you know it's not enough to just think it? It's not enough to just think it. Jesus didn't just think something to the fig tree. What does it say? It doesn't even say, oh, look at the mountain and wish that it would be removed. What does it, what does it say that we have to do? We have to say something. We have to use our words to say something. A sound mind, and how many of you know God wants us to have a sound mind? A sound mind agrees with what God says and declares it as so. God hasn't given me what? A spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Well, what is a sound mind? A sound mind thinks like God and speaks like God. And things are under the dominion of your words. We see this here. Whoever says to this mountain, be thou removed, and doesn't doubt in his heart, what he says will take place. So how many of you know our words carry authority? Your words carry authority. Life and death, Proverbs tells us, life and death are what? In the power of your tongue. And you know what? There is teaching out there that says, oh, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, your words, your words. But you know what? Words created what you're walking in right now. The world, words are powerful. And you know what? The enemy wants to diminish words. He wants to make you think it's not that big of a deal. How many of you think that it probably to the natural person, looked pretty silly when Jesus came up to the fig tree, which is, it's a tree. We're not even talking about a person here. (laughs) This is a tree. And he was talking to a tree. Most people would say, "Uh, Jesus, have you lost your mind? But you know what he understood? There's authority in my words. And when I speak to something, things happen. And you know what? He didn't dance around the tree. He didn't think to the tree. He spoke to the tree. He spoke to the tree. Okay. um, Matthew 16, 19. And this verse just talks about, again, um, the authority of our words and, and the authority that we have because Jesus gave us this authority. It's not my words. It's his words in my mouth. And his words in my mouth carry authority. They carry power. Okay, Matthew um, 16, 19 says this, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth must be what is already bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth must be what is already loosed in heaven. So what do we see that he says here? These keys he's given you. Well, what are the keys? The keys are authority. He's given you authority. Say, Jesus has given me authority. Authority to do what? To bind. Well, how do, you, how do you bind up? With your words. With your words. Do you know you can bind something up with your words? You can lose something up with your words? So these keys represent authority. So think, if you have keys, you know, most of us don't now because we have garage door openers with codes. But if you think of a key to give you access into what? Your home. So I don't have the keys to Jonah's house. So guess what? I, if, if Jonna's house is locked up and I don't have the keys, I don't have access or authority to, to go into her home. But you know what? Jonna probably has keys to her home. And you know what? Those keys give her authority. Well, you know what Jesus said? I've given you the keys. In other words, here's the authority. It's yours. You have it because of what Jesus has provided and given for us. 
And what's amazing is these keys aren't based on a feeling. If you think about authority and you think about a police officer, okay, and that police officer usually probably when he's going to work, what does he do? He gets up and he puts on that uniform, puts on his badge. Well, what if he wakes up that morning and he's like, oh, I'm just not feeling very good. You know, I don't think I'm going to put on my police uniform because it's not going to do any good because I'm not feeling good today. No. He still, even though he may not be feeling good, what does he still do? He still puts on that uniform and goes to work. How many of you know and understand your authority isn't based on how you feel? And the enemy wants to convince you, I can't speak that. I can't say that. I can't do that because of what I did yesterday. Or I can't speak that or do that because of what I've said in the past. Or I can't speak that or do that because I don't feel like saying that. But how many of you know your authority that Jesus has given you isn't based, it's not flighty. It's not, we don't work ourselves up to have authority. It's just simply based off of what Jesus has provided and given to us. And how that's exercised is through our words. Okay, um, so just like Jesus, what did he do? He answered and he talked to the fig tree. He talked to it. He answered it with words. So if symptoms try to attach themselves to your body, we just heard it with Amanda in her testimony, If those symptoms try to attach itself to your body, what should you do? Speak to it. Why? Because your your body is under the authority of the word of God. It must come into line with the word of God. What's greater authority? The symptoms and the feelings in your body or the word of God? The word of God is greater authority over symptoms, over sickness, over disease. Amen? Okay, so what do we see? Um, Mark 11, uh, we'll read this 20 through 22. And this is just uh, further down. So I love this. So Jesus was with his disciples. What do we see that he did? He spoke to the fig tree. And you know what? He, he just spoke to it. And like I said, he didn't do this little dance around it. He didn't, he didn't work up emotions. He just spoke to it. And um, it says here, in the morning, so what happened? Time had passed, right? Time had passed. When they were passing along, they noticed, the disciples, noticed that the fig tree was withered completely away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Master, look, the fig tree which you doomed has withered away. And Jesus replying said to them, have faith in God. And in parentheses it says, constantly. But what I see in this is they're walking by. Peter notices, Peter remembers, hey, we were just here yesterday. Jesus cursed, you know, the fig tree. And it's almost like Peter's surprised, like, oh, guys, look, Jesus, look, you, you spoke to the, that fig tree and it's already dead. And Jesus wasn't like, oh my gosh. Wow. Can you believe it? I cursed it yesterday. And it's already dead. No, what did he respond with? He wasn't surprised. He wasn't shocked. Why? Because he knew the authority that he had. He knew the words of power that came straight from the Father. He knew the authority that he walked in. And you know what he said? And you know what he responded with? And not a surprise. Yeah. Have faith in God. It's that simple. Have faith in God. So what did Jesus do? He left And let the words that he spoke do the work there. Like I said, he didn't he didn't dance around the tree, he didn't do some little hoorah, he didn't what did he do? He just spoke the word, he left, and he let the word do the work. And what do we see? I love this that it wasn't just like the tree was kind of dead. It says that the tree was withered away from the roots. This is the power in the word of God. It doesn't just barely attack sickness. It doesn't just barely attack lack. It it annihilates it from the roots. So when the word of God is put on sickness or disease, it annihilates it. Like I love that it, it 
says in the word that it went to the root. It didn't just address the surface stuff. So when we're speaking the word and when we're using the word of God, it goes to the very root of things. And you know what? I don't have to know how that works. I don't even necessarily have to know the root of what it is. All I have to do is know that there's power in the word of God, and I have to put faith in that word and release that word. And when that word is released, in it is all the power that it needs to heal any disease, to bring finances, to restore relationships, whatever it might be. Okay. Now we're going to look here um, at Matthew 8, 5 through 10. So what we saw there is words of power were spoken. And why was it a word of power? Because Jesus had faith in what he spoke. Jesus had faith in the words that he was speaking. And so therefore, when our faith is attached to the word of God, it's power. Okay, Matthew 8, 5 through 10. It says, Jesus went into Capernaum, and a centurion came up to him, begging him, and saying, Lord, my servant boy is lying at the house, paralyzed and distressed with intense pains. And Jesus said to him, I will come and restore him. But the centurion replied to him, Lord, I am not worthy or fit to have you come under my roof, but only speak the word. Can everyone say that? Only speak the word. Only speak the word, and my servant boy will be cured. For I also am a man subject to authority with soldiers subject to me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. What's amazing about this is the centurion basically here is talking about the power of words. So what's he saying? I don't even need you to come to my house. All I need is I know there is such authority and power in words. He understood authority. He understood honor. Why? Because he understood I'm a master and I understand when I tell my servants do this, do that, with just what? Just a word that it happens. And then Jesus, when he heard him, he marveled and said to those who followed him, um, sorry, I tell you truly, I have not found so much faith as with anyone, even in Israel. So what do we see? Jesus marveled because this man was so convinced of the power of words. And not just at the power of words, but the power of Jesus' words. So this was a life and death situation, right? This centurion was asking for what? His servant to, to be healed. So this was a, a big situation. So can you imagine someone you loved? Obviously, we know that this master loved this servant. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been approaching Jesus to ask him to heal him. Right? So this is someone that he loved and cared for. So when he asked Jesus, this faith that this centurion had invited the power of God. And he believed that this power would work on his behalf. So let's just picture for a moment. Think if the servant at home, you know, obviously we know he, they weren't present in this moment. The servant was sick back at home. But think in this moment if this servant could hear Jesus and the centurion. And the, the servant's listening and he hears the centurion go to Jesus and say, hey, you know, my servant, he's sick. I need you to heal him. And how did Jesus respond? Okay, I'll come. I'll come and I'll, I'll restore him. And restore means from the root. Make him whole. All the way healed and whole. So Jesus said he's coming. So what would the servant be like? Oh, yes, Jesus, he's coming to my house today. I'm, I'm going to receive my healing. But then he hears the centurion or the master say, no, no, actually, you don't need to come. Just give me your word. How would we respond in that moment? Think if this was, was someone you loved, your child, or someone that you love, and you come on their behalf because you want to see them healed and restored, and you tell them, just tell them what's going on, and Jesus says, yes, I'll come and restore him. And then he says, ah, 
The centurion, nope, you don't have to do that. Just say your word. How would we respond to that? Like, that's a good question to ask ourselves. What, would I say what the centurion said? No, just give me, just give me your word. Or, or do I have to have him present feeling in the moment? Or is his word, am I submitted enough to him and under his authority to understand that the very words that he speaks is life? The very words that he utters has everything that I need contained in it. This is where the centurion was at. It's powerful. So the centurion had such honor and reverence for Jesus that he could say, speak the word only. So what did he do? He just told Jesus or the miracle worker, you don't need to come to my house. He said, you don't need to show up. I don't need your physical body there. I don't need to see something. All I need is your words because I know your words do something. What's amazing here is um, actually Pastor Nate and I were kind of talking with Jake and Sheen last night actually just about this story, but how powerful it is um, because he wasn't, this centurion was a Roman. He wasn't even a covenant Jew. So he didn't, he didn't have the covenant that the Jews had. And what's amazing is that Jesus turned to the Jewish people and said, I haven't seen such great faith as this. Why was this? Because, like I said, he understood authority, and he had honor and reverence for God. And actually, I think it's, um, I don't know what, I think it's actually Mark, Luke, Luke's account that talks about um, how they believe that it wasn't the centurion. Do you want to say it? I feel like you'd do better. Here's the plug for your Bible reading. If you were reading this week on this Monday, I guess it would have been Monday, you would have read this same account in the book of Luke, but it says that the centurion was actually at his house, and he sent his servants to go talk the same way if the president invited me over for dinner. He probably wouldn't come to my door. He'd probably send his delegates, and I would be telling you that, hey, the president invited me to dinner. Well, somebody I might in more detail say, well, actually, so there's two, I went to my door and there's two guys at my door and I was like, oh my gosh, they're in black suits and, right, and then all of a sudden they, it was the president wanted to invite me to dinner. But to somebody else, I might simply say, hey, the president invited me to dinner. And so this account in Matthew and the account in Luke where, where the centurion with the boy that he loved who's sick simply sends his servants out and tells them and then when he hears that Jesus is on his way, he said, you know what, don't, don't even come because you're not, I'm not worthy to have you come under my house, right? Just simply speak the word of my servant will be made whole. So what were you asking me? Yeah, Luke, I'm sorry. Luke, Luke. But it's a powerful picture of just, again, painting the picture of the power of the authority of the word and, and what words carry. And this man understood that Jesus carried words of life. Because, and it's all really what we've been talking about and what Pastor Nate's been talking about, but resisting the devil, right? Well, how can we resist the devil? We have to first submit. We have to first come underneath that authority. Well, this centurion was com coming underneath the authority of Jesus. And so we see that uh, the word worked there. So all you need in the face of a need is the word, all you need in the face of a need is the word. Why? Because the word is enough. Whatever situation you're going through, whatever mountain is in your way, the word is enough. And what do we see here? That the written word is the same as Jesus himself standing in front of you. That's what this account really is portraying. Jesus didn't have to physically come to the house. Why? Because this centurion said, just, just at your word. Well, what do we have? What do you have tonight on your device or, or here? His word. We have to have such um, submission and belief that this word 
is the exact same power as if Jesus were present, standing right here in front of you tonight. So when I open this word in the morning and I'm reading, when I come to prayer in the morning and I'm reading the word, I don't have to have a sign. I I don't have to have angels show up and lights flashing and Jesus himself to appear and then go, oh, that's what this is. When I open the word up and I'm reading the word, that, that is everything that I need. It has that much life in it. What, is it. what does it talk about in Romans 12? That it's, it renews our mind. So when I put my eyes on the word, when I speak the word, when I declare the word, it, it changes my physical brain. Do you know that? There's actually proof that the word rewires and physically changes your brain, physically changes your body. Praying in tongues affects your mind and your body. This stuff is powerful. And we have to get back to, I don't have to have a, now I'm not, signs are great, all of that. But I'm saying we have to get to the place where we take God at his word and we believe his word is as powerful as Jesus himself present with me right now. Okay, so the power in this word is not any less, any less. What do we know? That Jesus is the word. He was the word. He lives in the word. So when you speak the word, Jesus is present there. It's words of power. Okay, um... John 6, 63, it says that his words are spirit and they are life. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3, 16. This is just talking about the word here. It says, every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration and profitable for instruction, reproof, conviction of sin, correction, error, discipline, and obedience, and for training in righteousness and holy living, conformity to God's will in thought, purpose, and action. So what do we see? God's word is powerful. It's life to us. Faith in the word of God is the key that opens heaven and activates the power of God to work in our lives. Faith doesn't wait. Faith answers with the word. We don't have to wait for the opposition to go away. (laughs) We keep speaking the word and declaring the word. Faith answers with the word. Life and death, we said this, are in the power of the tongue. And um, I want to look here, um, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. And um, just specifically what I kind of wanted to target in the tail end of, of this message is just even the importance of the word over our minds physical minds, and our bodies, and the importance of declaring God's word over our bodies and over our minds. Okay, 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20 says this, do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you, whom you have received as a gift from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Purchased with a preciousness and paid for, made his own. So then, honor God and bring glory to him in your body. So what do we see here? You were bought and paid for. Your body is a temple. So you know what? It's not, an, it's not good enough just that our spirit is recreated and new. Thank you, Lord, for that. But how many of you know, all through the word, it doesn't just talk about your spirit. It talks about your soul being healthy, which is your mind, will, and emotions. It talks about your body being healthy. How many of you know in order to finish your race and to finish what God's asked you to do, you kind of need a body. And you kind of need a mind working right and proper. Right? This is, we get one mind and we get one body. And we need it to work properly in order to finish our race with joy, to finish our race strong. How many of you, I don't want to quit early. 
I don't want to end my race early. I want to finish strong. How many of you want to finish strong? Well, guess how we finish strong? The word. The word in our mouths, the word declared and believed over our minds, over our bodies. The word is just so, so important. So these spiritual laws of, of words and the authority that we have and speaking the word set things in motion and change courses. And how many of you know if you've ever, you know, I don't know a lot about flying and I don't know a lot about boating, but I know if you just do small little course corrections that don't seem big in the moment, but you are faithful to continue to, to do those, you'll end up like way over. Well, this is what the word does. We may be going down a road in our mind, in our bodies, in circumstances, in life, and just small changes of applying the word there and speaking the word over that can make a huge difference of where we end up. By what? Continuing with the word. Continuing with the word. Not stopping. I said this, I think, last week, but this is a word that the Lord's been highlighting to me just in my Bible reading, I've been seeing it a lot, but continue. How many times the word talks about or paints the picture of continue, continue, continue. Why? Don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't stop. What does the enemy want to get us to do? To look at how we feel, what the situation looks like, the doubt, the word's not working. But how many of you know the word always works? It always accomplishes what it's sent forth to do. So don't stop speaking the word. And I want us, we're going to just kind of end tonight um, with one more passage of scripture. And then we're going to actually apply this. And we're going to use our words tonight to speak and declare some things over our mind and over our bodies. Because I sense this so strong and just even for myself, just just being convicted of not doing this enough over my health and over my body. And Pastor Nate and I were talking today, and, you know, it's, it's great to, be, to eat healthy. It's great to exercise. It's great to do all of those things. But how many of you know that's the purpose for God giving you a body wasn't to be fit? Honestly, the purpose of your body wasn't even to be healthy. The purpose of your body was to serve him. Now, we want our bodies serving him healthy and fit, but that shouldn't be the purpose of what we're doing for our body. Does that make sense? It's, it's all in the motive, the motive of why we're doing what we're doing. It is the motive of why I'm eating healthy and working out, number one, under the authority of the Lord, because he's asked me to do this again. Authority, Lord, what are you saying? What do you say about my body? What do you say about what I'm putting in my mouth? What do you say about my mind and what I'm filling my mind with? What do you say? And then when I find out what he says, then there's faith there and there's power there to tap in to the grace to do what he's asked me to do. But it's all out of line if, if what I'm doing to be healthy is just to be healthy and to be fit. <laughs> It's all in the motive of why I'm doing it. Why it, It's the verse we just read there in Corinthians that my body was bought with a price. So you hear the, my body, my choice. Not if you're a born-again believer. shouldn't be. It should be your body, his choice. His choice. His choice. Why? Because my body's been bought. Now, can I do what I want with my body? Yep. I can do whatever I want with my body. Pastor Evan could go down and do whatever she wanted with her body. But you know what? That wouldn't be profitable. There's certain things, yes, free, free will. God gives us free will. He's not tying my arm to make sure that I obey and submit my body to him. So, yes, we have choice to do what we want, but you know what the word tells us? That it's not profitable. There's certain things that aren't profitable for your body to do. That as a temple of the Holy Ghost, you shouldn't find your body in certain locations or doing certain things with your body or with your mind. Why? Because it's, it should be under his lordship and, and submitted to him as a temple unto him, holy unto him. 
Okay, so let's just look at this last one, James 3, 3 through 6. And this is all about the tongue. It says, if we set bits in the horse's mouth to make them obey us, we can turn their whole bodies about. Likewise, look at the ships. Though they are so great and are driven by rough winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the impulse of the helmsman determines. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and it can boast of great things. See how much wood or how great a forest a tiny spark can set ablaze. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a world of wickedness set among our members, contaminating and depraving the whole body and setting on fire the wheel of birth. Sorry, this is the amplified. It's very wordy. But what do we see here? Your tongue steers your life. That's summing this passage of Scripture up. That your tongue is steering your life. So if you don't like where your life is at right now, then look at what your tongue's been saying or not saying. What have I been saying? What have I been saying about my body? If you don't like how you're feeling, if you, if you don't like certain things, well, what have I been saying about it? Have I been saying, yeah, I'm just getting old, and yeah, this is just what happens when you get old. You just can't get around as good. You know your body hears and submits to the words of your mouth? Do you know you have the ability to choose what you think on? You have the ability to choose and to speak. God gave you that ability. And I'm very thankful that he's not making us, he's not wanting robots. He's wanting heart. So he's given us a choice and a free will to align ourselves with what his word says. What his word says And when we understand and come under, just like the centurion, and we understand that there's words of power. And and let me say this. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death. And if we truly believe that, then what we speak really is either life or death. And so what we're speaking about our minds, what we're speaking about our bodies, what we're speaking over other people, over our children, over our workplaces, over those in authority, life or death. And we're going to eat the fruit of what we're speaking. Okay, so let's um, stand up and we're just going to, you can um, play Chris, that'd be awesome. And we're just going to use this time to just, like the centurion, What did he say? Only speak the word and your servant will be healed. So we're going to use tonight the words of our mouth because sometimes some of us may, you know, we hear messages like this and we think, oh, that's great to, you know, speak or to, to say things, but then we don't always do it or maybe we don't know how. But I wanted us to put into practice tonight speaking some things over our minds and over our bodies. And this isn't about the person next to you. This is about you. This is about you using God's word and words of life to speak and declare and set in motion your mind and your body. And you know what? I want everyone in this room to finish their race strong and and joyful, which, which means what? That my mind is sound. I'm not battling oppression and depression. I'm, I'm not down and under. I'm not anxious. I'm not fearful. My mind is sound. My body is healthy. We need the body of Christ strong and healthy and finishing their races, not quitting early because our bodies are giving out or because our minds are in turmoil. God needs his end of days church strong And so part of being strong is submitting to his authority and saying what God says, but then also taking time to ask him, Lord, is there areas in my life? Is there areas in my mind or in my body that aren't fully submitted to you that I'm not underneath your direction? You know, I heard, um, I forget who it was just recently. They were sharing someone um, was talking to, to them and they came up for uh, prayer afterward and um, for healing. 
and he he said I need healing you know I've just been battling some stuff and so this minister said okay well we'll agree in prayer and he said the the man that came up for healing said you know I think I know what it is I think I know it's whenever I drink coffee I just I don't feel good and it affects my body and it affects and so this minister said okay well if you know then maybe the first step, if you're feeling like you already know what that direction is, that you need to stop drinking coffee. Well, I don't want to do that. I just want you to pray for me. But how many of you know sometimes the word of God comes to us very tailored and specific with specific direction and instruction? But I do want to say one thing. That specific direction and instruction is for you, not for your neighbor. So when I'm trying to force my eating habits or my whatever convictions that God's talked to me about onto someone else, they're not going to have the same grace and the ability there. And actually, it can bind them up and be tormenting. So God gives you words of power for your own body, for your own mind. He gives you words and direction. But you know what it takes? Submitting under his his lordship even in those small things that he tells you and sometimes we can um push aside those things or negate them because we don't see it as super like it's i don't really think it's that big a deal it couldn't be that but if we follow those small nudges and we continue in the word and continue to submit under his his lordship and his word we'll see symptoms in our body turn we'll see things turn when we're submitted unto him Okay, so we're going to say this, and I want you to just close your eyes, and I want you to just put your hands on your body. And this is just as an act of faith to say that, Lord, I'm, I'm submitted to you, and this body, like we just read in Corinthians, is what? It's a temple of the Holy Ghost. It's been bought with a price, and I want you to picture that. Jesus bought you with a price. And this body, this mind, is to glorify him, to bring him glory, purchased and bought. So let's just say this. Father God, thank you for my life, for my spirit, for my soul, for my body. I appreciate my body, and I'm thankful to be alive. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Thank you for my body, which is redeemed and has been bought with a price. It is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I am not my own. I belong to you. I say, this body is for you, Lord. And you, Lord, are for my body. I am under your authority. I am yours to command. I acknowledge what you have said about our words, and your words are true. Life and death are in what we say. So forgive me for all the negative things that I have said over myself and over my body, over every part. Forgive me for talking feelings and discouragement, talking defeat and death, saying I can't, saying I don't have. That's not right. It's wrong, and I repent for it. And I receive cleansing and forgiveness. With long life, you satisfy me and show me your salvation. I will finish my course. Your word in my mouth carries power. I speak the word only. Body. I have stewardship over you, and you must listen to my words and the name of Jesus. 
And so I speak to you. Be cleansed of every evil thing, every disease, every infection and growth, every virus and bacteria, any inflammation. I say, you cannot stay. I command you to die and be removed from the root and eliminated out of my body. Blood, be cleansed and made right. Heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, pancreas, all my organs and glands, you be cleansed and restored. Body, you are strong. You are healthy. You come into alignment and you be healed in Jesus' name. My whole body, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet and everything in between, you belong to the Lord. All right, now I want you to put your hands on your head if you're not doing that already. And I want you to say, Lord, thank you for my brain. I call my brain healed. I call my brain healthy. I call my brain restored. Anything that isn't of you must die, dry up, and be removed. Tissue, you be healthy. Mind, you be quickened and made full of light and life. Restored and healthy in Jesus' name. Dedicated to you. All right, now let's just lift our hands and let's just say this. We will finish our race strong and in joy. Let's say it again. We will finish our race strong and in joy. Now I want to make it personal. I will finish my race strong and in joy. Let's say it again. I will finish my race strong and in joy. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. So be it in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Let's just lift our hands and thank him. Thank you, Lord. We receive that by faith. We thank you that your word is working in our minds. It's working in our bodies. It's working in our finances and in our relationships. Your word is working. Your word is working. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. The word is working. And you know what I love about I will finish my race strong and healthy and enjoy because it paints a picture for you. The enemy has come for too long of painting you as feeble and broken and uh, barely coming across. I think of like the marathon runners. Have you seen them? Like they finish, but they're like, we're not going to finish like that. We're going to finish strong and healthy and full of joy. So when the enemy wants to come to whisper any other picture, because words paint pictures, any other words that paint a picture other than strong, healthy, and joyful, you rebuke that thought and you tell it to go and then you replace it and you say, no, I will finish my race strong, healthy, and full of joy. My children will finish their race strong, healthy, and full of joy. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, go enjoy and go to bed speaking the word over your mind and your body tonight. All right. Love you all. Don't forget prayer in the morning, 6 to 830.